at this time we will actually enter into our presentations and first we will have Mr. Regis Barton. Mr. Regis Barton is a former student of the State University of New York College where he obtained a Bachelor's of Science degree in Management Information System. While he was at college, he was the president of the Student Government Association and was incorporated into the National Residence Hall Honorary, the Charles Allgreen Leadership Academy and the Harvard Business Summer School Venture Management Program. Upon completion of his degree, he returned to Antigua where he started a temporary internship position, which eventually led to a permanent position as human resources, systems technology and employee engagement officer at the Antigua Public Utilities Authority. Regis is a former co-founder and chief executive officer of the Nolan Hugh Foundation. And the Nolan Hugh Foundation is a social enterprise which focuses on the professional development of youth. Regis believes strongly that youth development and support are imperatives for youth to achieve their full potential and also to rise, to raise the standard of professionalism in Antigua and Barbuda and the wider Caribbean. He believes that raising the standard of professionalism of professionalism will ultimately improve the productivity level in the country and it will increase generally. He hopes to play a part in introducing and improving professionalism in cultural norms through the Caribbean and beyond. He is actually selected as an international ambassador for one Young World Foundation and recognized for his outstanding community work and positive role model, which leads to his receipt of the Queen's Leadership, Young Leadership Award in 2016. I hand over to Regis. Good, Good day, thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you. Can you see my screen, Lady Michelle? Yes, we okay. are seeing your screen. Going thank to take you. that as a green light. So I want to say a special thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Regis Burton. A special thank you to the members of CARICOM, uh, but specifically to the organizers, the members of the CARICOM Youth Ambassador course. Before we start, I would definitely like to wish each and every one a happy World Youth Day. Um, it is our day and we should celebrate and should enjoy it. Today, I was asked to come and give a short presentation, um, brief, so I won't take much of your time, on the topic, forging the way forward, but specifically bridging the skills gaps for young people, for youth within the workplace. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna say thank you for your time today and welcome to our presentation. Uh, Lady Michelle would have mentioned a few of these things that you see before you, and. And many of these are just my brand. Um, so you would see where I work, you would see the one young world, you would see the fact that I once played cricket. And if I can take you on the journey from cricket, I once went to the World Cup in 2010, representing the United States of America. And after that, many would say, why didn't I continue playing cricket? Uh, I took the journey of accepting and a more professional lifestyle rather than a professional athletic lifestyle. From there, it brought me to the development of my own foundation. And like you would have heard, our focus is to create opportunities for young people. I found that within the Caribbean, uh, we lack opportunities. And it wasn't a case where the talent was lacking. It was just those areas to improve and to develop ourselves. So if you could join me and take a quick look at what the Nolan Hugh Foundation does. And I hope you enjoy.
Regis, we're not hearing the um, sound. I think you'll have to share the sound. He did say that we were having a look at it. Okay, so I see that you're not hearing it. A question I had uh, is, does anyone think that it's challenging to find employment? Uh, and I asked it to a few of my friends, I asked it to some of my colleagues who already have a job. But what was interesting it was to find out that majority of the individuals who took part in the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors 2020 survey, they said that no, it's not challenging to find a job. And I found that as a positive, uh, because you, uh, originally I thought everyone would say, yes, it's hard to find a job. So something is good from, from the data that was presented. But what I want us to get away from is the fact that we're just looking for a job. You know, it's, I want it to be that it's not about finding a job, but it's about bringing value to a position. So we all have the same 24 hours, but it's just what value you bring to a position in your 24 hours. So first thing to remember for me, don't worry about finding a job, but more so focus on the value that you bring to any position, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's at church, whether it's at home. The key is to bring your value. So many people always ask me, you know, so how do I get a raise? How do I get more money? And my answer to them is simply just increase your value. So today I just want to go quickly over a few points that I would recommend on how you can increase your value and just improve yourself as an individual. So the first thing here says judgment. What I want you to get is that we all live in a society that judges. Whether we think it is right or wrong, I just want you to accept that. Many of you are going to judge me because I'm wearing a suit. If I had locks, you'd have made a, a, an assumption as a judge. So we do live in that world. So you need to understand that. The second thing is that Within life, there are things that you can control and that you can't control. And as young people, I encourage us to focus on the controllable elements of life. One of the key I'm controllable like, like six, I'm one of the key controllable element is our career, our career path. Where do we want to go? How do we want to better ourselves? So ensure that you're in the driving seat of that. The third area is to seek a purpose-driven employment. Uh, it is not something practiced commonly in Antigua or in the Caribbean, but it, it's what you should do for the next 10 years. Try to find a job or some sort of employment that, that you're working towards a purpose. Yeah? You're, you're aligning with your personal goals and desire syncs with the company's personal goals and desire. Don't just try to find a job for the money or just try to, to, to buy time. In England, there's a concept called community interest companies. It's not in the Caribbean as yet, but I'll encourage each of you to research it. It's where a company is formed, but its purpose is not to make a profit it's, or to give dividends to its shareholders. Its purpose is to solve a problem in society. So we need to get away from this capitalist society mentality where everything is about money and everything is about money to make me richer. Young people need to start creating businesses, finding jobs where they're doing something that's more purposeful in their life and to the betterment of the world. If we keep moving, I will definitely encourage you all to do what I did. I went on a personal and a professional development journey. And it says journey because it means that it's never ended. Uh, it's, there's no end to what we're working towards. Every day you wake up, you're aiming to make yourself better by learning something new, reading something, listening to a podcast, um, uh, and just, Get on the journey where development is a key thing. In this day of information and technology, uh, as young people going into workforce, what makes us stand out is our ability to communicate. But what we tend to forget is that our non-verbals are the one that speaks louder than our verbals. So be mindful of your verbals, non-verbals, and most importantly in this day and age, your technical skills. You definitely need to stand out in your technology, your ability to use these different devices because we have three-year-olds, four-year-olds who can use laptops, tablets by far better than many of us. So they're coming for us. Um, their knowledge of technology has advanced and I'm encouraging each of you to do the same. Additionally, to increase your value, to get that bigger job, get the bigger paycheck, to make a bigger impact, to, to identify your purpose, I'll encourage each of you to learn a foreign language. 
I'm not just saying this, I'm not trying it. I'm currently a student at the University of the West Indies pursuing my master's in international management and Spanish. So I'll encourage you to pick up one of these two languages, Mandarin or Spanish, which are both the fastest growing languages spoken globally. And the last two things, I think our, the generations before us and the educational system that we are part of now, they fail to teach us both our local and Caribbean history. But just because of those failures doesn't mean you can't take the initiative upon yourself. So I'm encouraging each of you to learn your local history and to learn the Caribbean history, understand the enslavement history records before we were slaves to the point of the travel to the Caribbean to where we are today and to where you are. And this will help you get to where we want to go. And then lastly, I need each and every one of us to embrace change and to learn to embrace change. So quickly, I'm going to do a quick activity and I encourage everyone to do it. If you're wearing a watch, you could just please identify it. And I, I want you to get the understanding of what is change. So if your watch is on your left hand, please join with me. Remove your watch so I can see some of you in the cameras. So please remove your watch and put it on your opposite hand. So if it's on the right, put it to the left. If it's on the left, put it on the right. Can I ask anyone who has done it to tell me how does it feel? Too strange. Strange. Anyone else? One word Odd. answers are fine. Odd. For me, it doesn't feel any type of way because I interchange my watch quite often. Some days I wear it on the left and some days I wear it on the right. So it's so great. Strange. Great, great, great. So we have three different perspectives and, and perceptions, and this is what I think changes. Change is going from the norm to going to a new state where at first it may be uncomfortable, it may feel strange um, to you, but whereas for others, it may seem as a, a, a regular. So as young people, we're very much on this word change, becoming change makers, but we really need to understand what is change and how do people perceive and receive change. So as young leaders, be mindful that change is not going to be something that we're accustomed to. Change is not going to be always light. But what happens over time, you do get accustomed to it, and then it's time to go back to the new norm. I think one of the key skills that is needed in this post-COVID new era, new world, however you want to phase it, is that we, as leaders and as young people, we need to understand what is emotional intelligence. And here you would see emotional intelligence, or short and EI, is the ability to understand and manage your own emotions and those of the people around you. People with high degree of emotional intelligence know what they're feeling, what their emotions mean, and how these emotions can affect others. It is not being taught in school. It is not being exposed to in the working world. But I'm encouraging you to take it upon yourself and to dig deep into the concept of emotional intelligence. But why? because it increases your leadership ability. It increases the team performance. It improves your decision-making. It decreases your stress. It reduces your staff turnover and increased personal well-being. If you know about yourself well enough, then you're able to, to understand and to apply it in different stages. Ironically, we all communicate differently. And if we were to all have a color to, um, to be assigned to how we communicate, for example, I could be a red and Miss Lady Michelle could be a yellow. When I'm speaking to Mich Michelle, it doesn't mean that I should be speaking from a red point of view, but I need to be speaking from a yellow point of view because that's what she understands. But unless I understand my own emotions, my own style, my own leadership, unless I understand myself, I won't be able to understand someone and to be able to understand the situation at hand. Additionally, I want to give you some tips to bridge the skills gap. For me, value your time and you need to know your worth. You know, so we, we all, I mentioned it earlier, we all have the 20, same 24 hours, but you need to know what your 24 hours means to you and how you're going to spend it. Set goals and aim high. Question to anyone is, do you want to be a good looking old person? You know, I surely do, but I realized that for that to be possible, I have to start a healthy lifestyle today. So I'll encourage each of you to do that. Break habits and routines. As young people, we're basically developing ourselves into our own habits and our own routines. 
what I'll encourage you to do is to tomorrow or from tonight, brush your teeth with a different hand, sleep on a different side of the bed, come off of the bed from a different side. Break these daily habits that we currently do. And what it shows you that is if you can break these small ones, you're able to do bigger things. So I started from the watch to the toothpaste <coughs> to going year to years without eating meat and just basically evolving and developing myself. But all of this came with the fact that I took risks. So I encourage you all to do the same. And don't be afraid to make mistakes because that's how we learn. We're going to learn from mistakes. We need to be put into the scenarios. And while we're long, young, learn what to do and what not to do. Two key things I really want everyone to get today is that we really need to end this age war. There's no young person versus old people. We, we need each and everyone to make that next step. As young people, yes, we may know how to do things faster, efficient, creatively, but the older individuals do have some experience that we don't, and nothing really beats experience. So we definitely need to bridge that gap also. The second one we need to end today is this gender war, where we're fighting against men versus female. Everything is about a balance from my perspective, and I hope that when you are a leader within any organization, you, you really try your very best to strike that balance because men can't do without women and women can't do without men. It's all, we're all in this together. What got me to where I am is I started my career as an intern and I found that internships are something lacking throughout the Caribbean. So if it's an advice I could give to CARICOM, it would be to increase the opportunity, the internship opportunities that are available for people. So many, many things that I have done so far started through the internship. Like I mentioned, I'm currently at the University of the West Indies and I'm also an intern at our local medical cannabis authority. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to gain experience because it's not always about the money in the short term. But so I'll encourage each of you to do this same. Take a risk and apply to any organization that you're interested in and ask them if I can intern today. I did it, I did it here at my current company. I did it at the authority. And I also did it with our governor general of Antigua and Barbuda by simply approaching him, writing formally to him and asking, how can I, as a Queen Young leader, help him as the governor general of Antigua and Barbuda? And today we have a really good professional and personal relationship. So take the chance. As we wrap up, I encourage you not to make this mistake. As Caribbean people who were once enslaved, we must learn to celebrate our success and those of others. So if you look close at the picture, you kind of see what they coin the crab in the bucket mentality. And it's continuing as the generation goes on. So today on World Youth Day, we need to really make a commitment that we're going to break away from this mindset. Uh, as easy as it is, it's not easy to see someone else do better and to, to, to celebrate it. But I'm encouraging each of you as, as world leaders, as change agents, that you should start celebrating not only your success, but the success of those around you. Lastly, especially going into the professional world, your attitude is all that matters. So yes, I can come and tell you it's good to learn Excel, there's softwares like Trello, um, getting coding degrees and all of that key technical things that are needed. But if you don't have a good attitude as a young person or anyone, it's going to affect you negatively. What I found is that manners can actually get you a job. Uh, if you just approach every situation with good manners, the old school style, what our grandparents were trying to tell us, it still works and is applicable today. Your resume is going to be one of your most important tool as a young professional developing yourself. I'm sure many of you have been part of resume writing. I have tons of notes on that. You can always ask me. But the newest thing that I will share, and it's my tip to you, is to add a barcode onto your resume. You can basically create a barcode that can link an individual to your personal website or link them to your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page. So that's what I've done recently. I've put a barcode onto my, my resume and it allows the, the readers to get more information about me more than just the one page that I'm submitting. So it's creative, it's unique, uh, and it's innovative. Networking is essential. Uh, as we're all spread across the Car Caribbean, I'll encourage each of you to host young professional networking events. 
In Antigua, the Nolan Hugh Foundation started by hosting young professional networking events because we realized that although we're all on this island, we don't know what each other is doing professionally and we don't have a young professional network growing, which is what the older generations did to get to where they are. So I'm highly, highly encouraging each and every one of you to host young professional networking events. It is definitely needed. In the working world, I encourage you to ask questions, but I also encourage you to question the answers that you get. We definitely lead people thinking, being more innovative, being more creative, and being more critical. So don't just always accept yes for your answer. Mm -hmm. Lastly, remember that work is not per personal. And I need you to understand what is money and how to make money work for you. As much as I love doing the non-charitable -char side of life, Nolan Hugh, I learned once that, you know, you don't want to grow up and you're 45, 50, and you're only looking back at, I did all charitable work and I have no financial stability now. So I'm going to urge everyone that although you're doing this charitable work, find a balance where, how, where you can make an income for yourself. Because unless you have, you can't help anyone. Unless you learn more, you can't give more. And those are just things that I'm telling you from my experience. And lastly, uh, is to be professional and to be a professional. If you're going to go into sports, accept it as a professional lifestyle. If you're going to hair addressing, barbers, massage therapists, become a professional in the industry and offer good customer service. I've been fortunate to travel many places in the Caribbean. And one thing we also have in custom is that we don't have good customer service. So as game changes, world leaders, please, please, please be a professional and offer good customer service. It is surely missing in the Caribbean. I'm going to very much try and get this audio to sync right now because I think this message is mostly important to everyone. And just remind you today that if you're really aiming to be the best in the Caribbean, then you're wasting your time. Aim to be the best in the world who comes from the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me know if you have any questions and I'm more than happy to help. All right. So I think we can all definitely agree that this was a fantastic presentation by Mr. Burton. Um, definitely informative. And I think one thing that really stood out to me um, is in accordance with something that I kind of learned at school is that it is not the strongest or most intelligent person or individual person, right? But those who can adapt to change. And that is actually a quote from Charles Down. Uh, at this point, speaker i just like to ask that if there's anybody with their mic unmuted to please um do so at this point we'll be bringing in miss rochelle james and rochelle james is a creative human resource strategist who holds a bachelor's degree in public sector management a master's in economic and social development and a graduate certificate in peace and conflict studies rochelle is a results-oriented human resource consultant, a talent acquisitionist and recruiter, and is also internationally certified uh, in senior professional and human resource. As a driven and accomplished professional, she is focused on providing value added solutions, a skill she demonstrated while serving as a member of the Industrial Relations Subcommittee of the Labor Market Reform Commission. This is one of many examples of how Rochelle has established herself as a sustainable development aficionado and a global citizen. In 2017, Rochelle was named Jamaica's Youth Ambassador to the United Nations and was later awarded the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence. The book, Climate Change Adaptation, authored by Rochelle James, gives a clear picture of her passion for research and her analytical skills. In 2019, she authored a second book entitled The Best Fit, Performance-Based Behavioral and Cognitive Interview Tools. Rochelle has held positions in national export strategy at JAMPRO and Rights Awareness Program uh, at the British Council, later expanded into a human resource profession where she worked with companies in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, the Cayman Islands, and St. Kitts and Nevis. She, she also runs her own career coaching and team building firm, Rochelle at uh, Rochelle James at all, and serves as the executive director for the charity Youth for Sustainable Development Movement. 
and is the CEO and founder of the Caribbean Society of Human Resource Professionals, serving 15 Caribbean nations. As a noted conference presenter and keynote speaker, Rochelle has a strong reputation for conducting interactive sessions that take part on a learning journey. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce once again, Ms. Rochelle James. Rochelle, I think you're still muted. <laughs> I was trying, I was trying to use the headset. Are you hearing me clearly now? Yes, yes, we are. Yes, excellent. So sorry about that. So let me get right into it. Thank you so much for having me and have, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that you're having a wonderful day so far. So I'm going to be talking about building your resilience. And as we go through the presentation, I want you to think of just what your purpose is. You might not know it now, but hopefully at the end of the presentation, I'll be able to share with you how you can identify it. So I'm starting off with my name, Rochelle James. You heard it already. And I'd like to put this statement at the beginning of my presentations. I'm here because someone asked me. I'm here because someone asked me. Most times when you're asked to do something, when you're asked to, to be a part of an event like this, to do a presentation, to speak, to share, initially, the instinct is to say no. You say no first, then you figure it out after, and maybe you'll say yes. So I'm encouraging you that this year, during this time, say yes first and figure it out after. So you might not have all the tools, all the information, all the skills you need to do it, but say yes first. So we have some images here on the screen and I want you to turn on your microphones if possible and think about the different brands that you see here and what you associate with each brand. And we're going to start off with Pampas. Babies. Babies. But we all know that Pampas is just a brand, right? Not all diapers are Pampas. No. But growing up, we thought I'm, what? Pampers now. <laughs> Who knew that not all um, mouthwash is Listerine? Yeah. Listerine, right? And you know, Cutex is a brand for nail polish. Polish, yeah. Pyrex is a brand for a container. So for those, for those of us who had grandmothers that used to serve food in Pyrex dish, it is a brand. <laughs> Thermos is a brand. <laughs> so your bottle or your container is a type of container called Thermos. I'm sharing these brands with you because event over time, brands that are strong enough, you forget about the product and start associating the product with the brand itself. So whenever you're trying to search for something online, you don't say, I'm going to do some online research. You say, I'm going to Google it. Correct? True. True. Yeah. So it, it has now become its own verb. So there's some images of persons here on the screen. And again, I'm going to ask you to turn on your microphones and tell me what your associations are with these different individuals. And we're going to start with the ones at the top of the screen. Anybody can speak. So just say the name based on the photo for the images on the top of the screen and tell me one word that embodies their brand. Michelle Obama, Empowerment. Okay, good. Michelle Obama, White House. <laughs> I like that. Bill, Bill Gates, Microsoft. Okay. Bill Gates, poisoning black people. Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. So we have Clorox. Clorox. <laughs> We have three other persons at the bottom of the screen. And in this case, I'm going to ask you to tell me two things. And I want it to be two things that are diametrically opposed, two opposite things about each brand there. Oh, 
Oh wow, that's difficult. Kanye. Yes. Billionaire. Mm hmm. Eccentric. Okay. Um, Anybody else wants to give it a try? Rihanna, mm -hmm. Barbadian, Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, anyone for Bolt? Wait, 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 wait. Bolt. Mm -hmm. Fast. Furious. <laughs> All right, so if and, we're looking and ulti ultimate entertainer, entertainer. All right, I'm going to start with that one. So you saying Bolt his brand originally was an entertainment brand. He was an athlete, yes, but he was known for someone who was just fun loving, um, um, e quite easygoing, composed, and a serious competitor. But then later on, as he grew and matured, his brand changed, and his brand changed to Bolt the businessman. So years gone by during the party season, you would probably see him at every party. And now he is Bolt the father and Bolt the entrepreneur. If we look at Rihanna, a similar shift happened in her career. And we're not talking about when she moved from good girl gone bad. We're talking about when she was just a musician. And now she is a business mogul and someone who is very versed in industry, has multiple brands. And I don't think she's held a microphone in the past couple of years. And finally, if we look at Kanye West, Kanye West has gone through many, many brand changes to the point the, the the last one prior to this was Kanye West, the Christian and evangelist. And then it was Kanye West, the future possible potential president. So his brand has also made transitions. And you'll find that as you transition through life, your brand makes transitions. But are they accidental transitions or are they deliberate steps, a deliberate decision to put aside this part of yourself and move on to something a little bit more mature. So that is what we're going to be going through today. And I'm going to ask you as we go through the session to think about these two things, writing down your gaps, write down what you're not. Think about you, yourself as a person, and write down some of the things you aren't and also the things you can be. So take a moment to think about that. So if you are not adventurous, you can write it down. I am not adventurous. I'm not a risk taker, but I can be adventurous. I can be a risk taker. Does anyone want to share one of their gaps? I wouldn't mind. Go ahead. I, so one of my gaps is being I suppose um, a community leader, I suppose, um, you know, very active. I'm an activist, but I'm not well rounded. I'm not um, well composed sometimes, right? admittedly. So, in you know, as much as I like doing all these things, like I'm, I'm a very active person, but then administratively, I'm kind of weak. So, I'm trying to work on these things. That's my gap. That's where my gap exists. So, that's what you can be then. You can be more organized. I can be more organized but I'm not yet. <laughs> right. Excellent. And that's exactly what it is. You have to have these conversations with yourself regularly because the worst thing you can do um, as, as a young professional, as a young person going into this new world, because the world has really changed because of COVID-19, is not having a good sense of self. And on a yearly basis, this is something, a conversation that I sit down and think about this, I write it down. What are my gaps? What am I and what am I not? And what can I be? Now, accept also that you won't always be able to address all of your gaps. There are some gaps that you can choose to live with, right? So based on the place that your life is,
have we lost Rochelle? I think we I'm going to be very awesome. I have an I can. I am I think I'm going to drop out about who you frozen. are. Hello? Hello? Hey, Rochelle, we lost you for a couple of seconds. So you we might just to to, um, maybe your last yes. couple of points. Yes. So I was saying, tell me about yourself. I am, I have, I can. So I am is how you view yourself. So I am a professional or I am um, a good public speaker. Then I have is whatever abilities or talents you possess, skill sets, your training, that kind of stuff. And then I can using what you are and what you have, how do you demonstrate it, right? So whenever anyone asks you to tell them who you are, if you're in an interview or you're just asked, you're just asked to introduce yourself, these are three statements that you should keep in your back pocket. Reading the scenario on the screen, I'm going to ask you to turn on your microphones and tell me how you'd address this one. You find yourself at a lever. A runaway trolley approaches five people who are tied to set who are tied to a set of tracks. Pulling the lever will divert the trolley to a different set of tracks where only one person is tied down. Do you pull the lever? It depends on who that one person that that's tied down is. Oh, what if it was your high school bully? <laughs> <laughs> I played the fifth. <laughs> Um, um, who, who, who would pull the who, who would pull the lever and who wouldn't? Who has another solution? I have another solution. Okay. I don't pull the lever, but the uh, the the addendum to that question is how do you divert the trolley? And I mm -hmm. would push the trolley off the rail with a truck. Okay. Okay. I like that one. But you, you're, you're, what the gist of it is that you would make the decision to try and save everyone. Yes, there's always an alternative. And that is your brand. The decisions we make demonstrate our brand and they say a lot about who we are. And the decisions we make on a daily basis, good, but the ones that we make in times of crisis, when there is a high pressure or high stress situation, when we're making those life changing, life altering decisions, that is the moment when it counts. And that is what says who we are as a person. So we all have visions of where we want to be. And in manifesting your visions, vision, there are seven steps. And I want you to make note of it. You can take a shot of the screen or you can write them down. Vision, seeing what you want. And that means writing it down. If you've ever done vision boarding, it's something that I recommend you do every year. And in 2020, you're probably going to have to revise your vision board every quarter. Um, desire. Being intensely excited and intense excitement means, you ever, have you ever seen a child that was promised something like ice cream or like you promised a child that they're going to Disney, but they're going like two years from now and they're just talking about it and they're so excited. It's like they get it already. It's like they're eating the ice cream. That's the intense excitement that you should bring to, to your vision and your goals in life. Belief believing that it is possible, having a vision or a goal, and then at the same time, spending all this effort doubting, boy, you know, I really want to work at that place. I really want that job, but I don't think they're going to hire me. And I don't think they want somebody like me. You've just killed it. Acceptance, accept that you have the ability to, whatever it is, you don't have it yet. You can get it, but accept that you have that capacity and that ability. Intent, want and intentions are two very different things. You can sit back and want to lose five pounds, but wanting to lose five pounds does not make you lose five pounds. You have to have intention behind your desires. Action, acting and behaving like it's already manifested, right? So if you are trusting for that special mate, 
you need to start making space in your bed for somebody else to be sleeping next to you. So you are changing your behavior to manifest your vision. And finally, allow, detach from the outcome. So we can try our best, but sometimes the, the planned outcomes or desired outcomes are not um, in line. So we have to also accept what the results are despite our best efforts. And my other bit of advice, everybody needs a career coach. No matter what's happening in your life, you need to find a career coach. Actively pursue this. There are three things that we all need. A coach, a mentor, and a sponsor. And another picture of both. You can tell that I'm a big Usain fan. Usain's coach was Glenn Mills. And Glenn Mills was not concerned about Usain the person. The, he was not concerned about Usain as an entrepreneur, as a professional, anything. All he was concerned with is that he was helping Usain win medals. He was concerned about him as an athlete, purely as an athlete. And that's what a coach does. A coach provides specialized support to you for a specific area of your life. So if you are pursuing a particular course of study or a, per, a particular profession, or if you want to be an entrepreneur, you find a coach for that specific area of your life. A mentor now is, is a more holistic, um, a person that offers support to your life in general and who you are as a person. Um, you see in Bolt's mentor was his manager, Norman Peart, who was intensely concerned about him as a person in every area of his life. So at one point when he was doing his interviews at first, he was, he was in Jamaica, we'd say he was twanging, but he was trying to speak standard English, but still had the thick Jamaican accent. So what Norman did was Norman got him a speech, speaking coach. And at the same time, he had someone teach him how to manage his money because he was concerned about you seeing the person. Finally, he had a sponsor. A sponsor does not provide financial support. A sponsor speaks, speaks about our future in the present. They speak about your future potential constantly. When you say in Bolt got injured, he was not supposed to get back into track and field. By no stretch of the imagination, he is more unique than the bumblebee. He should not be running as fast as, or ran. He shouldn't have run as fast as he did. But Puma believed in him. So when every other sponsor was okay, they're, they're, you should drop him. The CEO of Puma said, no, we're not going to drop him. Let's see if he recovers from his injury and we're going to stick with him. And it paid off for them in the, in the long run. But you actually need someone who is there cheering you on and can speak to your future state, even in your present condition. And know that we've gone through all that. I want you to spend a moment to write down what you're most confident about in your abilities and what you're, you believe that you're worthy of. And we're all worthy of something. We, you can write down anything at all. I love words of affirmation. I'm not a gift person. I don't, I don't like presents, but I like commendations. When you tell me, oh, you did such a good job, that makes me feel great. So I'm worthy of that. And I believe I'm worthy of that. So spend a moment to write it down. You don't have to do so now. The final thing that I want us to touch on here is authenticity. Nobody likes a fake. And if you're fake, you're going to find that the moment people find out your fakeness, they're going to lose interest in whatever you're trying to pursue. Going against your values is fake and a lack of authenticity. Not meeting your commitments or making a promise, whether it is of your time or to deliver on something specifically. Looking to others for validation is also a lack of authenticity. You only need validation from yourself. Measuring yourself against other people is another example. And blaming others for your shortcomings if you're a problem pointer. So when anything happens, anything pops up, your first instinct is to say, oh, but it's not my fault. And not accepting responsibility. Those are things that demonstrate a lack of authenticity. But to counter that, 
you need to focus on above the line behavior, being accountable, taking responsibility, being trustworthy. People, people know, people should know that you're someone who honors your word and your commitment and you're balanced and you're fair, you're respectful. You know, all those things that our parents and grandparents used to tell us about being respectful, um, accept th these last three critical, being courageous. Um, there's nothing worse than someone whose feedback or opinions on something is only shared after a complaint is made. If you have a strong opinion, say it in the moment and don't wait to be prompted by someone else. Then it's not authentic. And accepting the past, we can't change it and it makes no sense belaboring it or going, about, going at it at nauseum. Accept it, accept the lessons, resolve and fix what is possible to resolve and fix and salvage and move on. And there are three simple steps to authenticity. So we did some self-assessment throughout this, the session so far. So you'd continue to do your self-assessments on a regular basis. Make a commitment to your truth. And finally, start with yourself. Now, in any situation, we love, oh, I wish I could change this person or I wish they would just stop. The only person you can change is yourself. That is the only variable in any situation that you have complete control over. So any change that you want to see in your life or in your environment, start with yourself. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Michael Manley. Any realistic vision of change must be based on the notion of empowerment of people. And I have a video that I'd like to share with you. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. When given the choice between being blind or being deaf, do you know what most people choose? Take a guess. They choose to be deaf. It's not breaking news, right? I mean, to choose the eyes is such an easy decision. So it boggles my mind, even though we cherish our eyes, so many people live without having a clear vision. Did you know that there are 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet? You probably did. But did you know that no two of them have the same iris pattern? I checked it out, it's a true fact. Even twins are different. Likewise, you, yes, you, have your own unique vision. At birth, the universe gave you a prescription that's custom-made lenses designed for you and placed in your heart. So do not live your whole life without having contact with that part. You know, life is kind of like that movie Bird Box. You know, with, with Sandra Bullock on Netflix, it was big. My point is, a lot of people are afraid to look at their dreams. But unlike the movie, you won't die when you see them. You will finally live. My little brother told me he was afraid of the dark last night. I tucked him in thinking, what a plight. Kids are afraid of the dark. Adults afraid of the light. I guess that's life. See, a wise man once said, there are none so blind is those who choose not to see. How many people do you know who were given a vision, given an idea, but chose not to act on it? They got the call, but hit the climb on the true purpose of their lives. Maybe this is you, and maybe you were scared. Maybe you needed someone else to confirm it and make it clear. But that's not how the world works, I swear. See, eyes that look are common. Eyes that can truly see are rare. Oh, you want proof? Well, let's play a game. I'm gonna make a statement and then you guess the person's name. You ready? Let's play. He was fired from a newspaper for having no imagination or original ideas. Walt Disney. Okay, next one. His teacher said he was hopeless and would never be a composer. That's Beethoven. How about this one? Her singing coach said she would never make it as a singer because her voice breaks too much. Lady Gaga. See, the critics couldn't see Tyrone Bogue's vision either. 
when Tyrone was 10 years old, he stopped growing. He was diagnosed with a rare disease that stunted his growth. He spent his whole life at the height he was when he was 10. So how could this boy play in the NBA for 13 seasons? Because he had a vision bigger than his limitations. Everybody told him he would never make it. When asked, how does it feel to be surrounded by men so much bigger than you? He said quite simply and intently, kind of feels like being a dime amongst pennies. Never, I repeat, never let the experts stop your dream. They can't see your heart. Remember, experts built the Titanic, amateurs built the Ark. Scientists say that the bumblebee isn't supposed to fly. They say it's, its puny wings can't hold up his body. They're just not anatomically right. <laughs> well, if bumblebees could speak, they would say, bro, you don't know my life. Last month, I was in the UAE, and what I saw brought tears to me. Only 50 years ago, all they had was sand and dreams, literally. No running water or electricity, but their vision was large. Today, you can eat lunch a half mile in the sky. Every citizen gets an education, and those roads for camels are now highways for cars. You know the old saying, shoot for the moon, and if you miss, you land amongst the stars? Well, in 2020, the Emirates have a space mission shooting to Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, what is your dream? You better own it. Do not let people with possibility blindness, nearsighted ambitions block your vision and give you life glaucoma. There have been over 107 billion people to have lived and died on planet Earth, but there has never been and will never be another you. You have greatness inside of you. You have a gift inside of you. So take that blindfold off now. Rip it up, break it. Life ain't just about making a living. It's about living your making. It is no coincidence that the year approaching is 2020 because I have a funny suspicion that if you work on your self-image and stop squinting at your ambitions, then 2020 won't be your year. It will be your decade of perfect vision. Thank you so, so very much. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Rochelle. That was excellent. Um, some of the takeaway that we have from this is that this is the decisions we make determine our brand. That for me was awesome. Um, as you mentioned that the importance of authenticity, self-assessment, commitment, and start with you. Let us look in the mirror because we are the only person who can change. And as the video projected that our self-image is important, we need to have a vision. I'll take the opportunity now to introduce to you the third speaker and just to remind you all to mute your mics um, once you're not asked to say anything and that we will be taking questions at the end of the last speaker. So our last speaker is Nicholas Key. Nicholas is a co-founder and executive director of Next Generation Creators, a nonprofit organization aimed at promoting the learning of digital literacy skills for youth in the Caribbean. Nicholas is a 2017 Prime Minister's Youth Award for, M for Entrepreneurship and the 2016 Queen's Young Leaders Runner-Up Award recipient. Nicholas is a PhD candidate at the University of the West Indies, Jamaica, in Sustainable Development Program, where his thesis concentration is on decentralized and distributed technology abortion of underdeveloped information system. Since the beginning of his career, he has launched companies in the sectors of education, marketing, big data, 3D, and 4D printing. He has had the honor of working with NASA, the European Organization and Nuclear Research, Red Cross International, and the United Nations or renewable energy related projects and a policy reform for developing countries and refuge camps. Nicholas is presently a Jamaican youth ambassador to the Camp Commonwealth and aims to give voice to the concerns highlighted 
throughout the diaspora while empowering generations of youth to play an active role in their country's development. His primary focus within his role are economic development and opportunity technology and education. In this role, he highlights the importance of technology and digital literacy in societies of developing countries in the Commonwealth. He spends the majority of his time consulting with various government agencies and private organizations throughout the diaspora and to help implement the technological solution in their society. I hand over now to Nicholas Key. Thank you. Nicholas? Yes, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Quick. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see. Yes, we are yes. seeing the screen. Yes, Nicholas. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here, uh, at least virtually. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I guess next year things will be <laughs> a bit more in person. Uh, but for now, um, I really wanted to touch on um, a few of the things uh, that we, I guess, can take advantage of today, um, especially in the looming um, pandemic with respects to uh, the digital ecosystem that we now are essentially all forced into. Uh, and so to kick things off, um, I essentially wanted to really look at um, or I wanted you to really reflect and think about the role of technology um, today uh, in society. Uh, currently, technology overall uh, contributes about the entire industry, that is, is about 5.2 trillion US dollars. Um, and so essentially, that only accounts for um, mainly the global south, sorry, the global north. Uh, because a lot of the a lot of data is not um, collected and aggregated about the global south, um, and that's really because um, we have not inherently invested in um, in technology development in our region, the global south that is. But even more um, even even specifically, um, like the Caribbean, for instance. Um, and so, with that being said, uh, with this huge industry, I think we can all recognize that. Software is essentially eating the world. It's eating everything. Um, and because of this, we have a, a whole lot of jobs being lost. But also, as a caveat, we have a, a whole lot more jobs being created and reinvented and transformed. Um, and uh, we see this every day with, you know, the, you know, like the, I guess the, the, the booming effect of like the digital camera and uh, like the decline of uh, companies such as Kodak, for instance, we're seeing um, the transformation of companies. We're seeing the demolishing of a lot of um, monopolies, traditional monopolies that is, um, to give rise to a lot of new aged um, monopolies. Uh, and so uh, some of them, of course, you probably know are, you know, the Facebooks, uh, Amazon, um, the Twitter, uh, and a few other big tech companies. And so we're going to continue to see um, a lot of that happening. Um, and this, those companies that I just listed, or rather the companies that we know about today, only touch on a fraction of um, the true impact of technology on the entire world. Um, we really haven't seen um, a huge disruption in um, a lot of areas that are key to our survival such as healthcare, education, um, agriculture, and even by extension, tourism. Um, there, I, I believe that because of um, this pandemic, things have essentially been accelerated and we're now going to be seeing um, the emergence of um, the augmentation of many of these industries because of that. So uh, before we dive into the, the crux of things, um, I'm sure from like, uh, I guess the introduction um, that Michelle made of me, uh, you probably know that I, I run this organization that essentially um, promotes the learning of digital literacy um, for youth. Um, and so many times when 
I, or by extension, we speak or think about digital literacy, uh, it really isn't um, captured as a standard, mainly because it hasn't been a priority for many years. Um, and so, as it turns out, um, it will have to be a priority now. Um, so just to um, give you like a blank slate um, and to give you even more context, digital literacy is essentially uh, the means by which uh, you have the ability to learn skills, to learn, um, work, uh, live in a society where communication and access to information is increasingly um, through digital technologies. Um, and so that can be from, you know, platforms, internet platforms, social media, and, you know, by extension, mobile devices. Um, and to extend on that, um, digital literacy really tackles a lot of factors surrounding learning and development. And so they happen to be design thinking, um, technology skills as a whole. Um, so things related to um, like software development and engineering. Um, there's mathematical literacy. Uh, there's information and communication technology, ICT literacy, and that really dives into a lot of media and communication um, means, uh, and essentially just a lot of research. Um, and there's, of course, general problem solving. Um, we happen to take a lot of these for granted, but um, I'm not sure if you've noticed, uh, well, you probably have noticed, the Caribbean in particular, uh, we haven't, we aren't necessarily come, uh, we aren't necessarily at the um, comparative rate as our um, North American or even European um, counterparts. Uh, and so that mainly is because um, of our um, lack of focus in this area in particular, um, and by overall, generally, the lack of um, development of the tech ecosystem. Um, with that being said, though, uh, I definitely see a lot of strides being made um, now because of the pandemic. And so I, I just hope that we will essentially um, con continue on that, uh, that path to you know, post-pandemic development. Uh, and so with that said, uh, we can take a little uh, step back, not even step back, but just observe what has been happening because of, of COVID-19 and our reactions towards it as um, a society. Um, it has essentially changed the way we learn, work, and play. Um, you know, in the past, um, it used to be where we need to uh, really head to a classroom or a lecture hall or a theater um, to learn from a professor or like faculty. Um, now, essentially, everything is, is pretty much online. It's not necessarily it, it not necess it's not necessarily the best solution right now, but it is what we have. Um, and as we have progressed over the past couple of months, we've seen uh, where a huge number of attempts have been made to really um, zero in on you know the the core facets of education, and not just education by extension, you know, just learning in general, um, and to really reimagine what. Uh, what the future of um, society will look like, what it will look like, you know, post the pandemic, um, especially as we continue to make a lot of strides in the development of technology globally. Um, it has also changed the way we work. Uh, so I'm not sure if many of you, um, well, rather for those of you who are working, I'm sure you have um, experienced where employers have maybe asked for you to work from home. Um, work from your living room or your bedroom. Um, and even in many cases, it has been um, mandated by a lot of governments to, for you to do so as well. Um, and so the challenges that are being faced now with regards to that is uh, to really zero in and think about um, what effective work looks like and what work really should be and how much, uh, and rather what boundaries we need to put in place um, to ensure that we have a, a healthy work-life balance. Um, and so the other, the other aspect of um, society that, you know, COVID-19 has really disrupted for sure is of course play. Um, no, uh, because we're essentially all, isolation, all isolated socially, uh, we're seeing um, a few innovations being sparked um, in the space of, you know, general recreation. Um, I'm sure many of you who like have Instagram, uh, you're probably aware of, you know, the augmented reality filters that you probably um, see. 
uh, the same with uh, Snapchat as well, and for sure, TikTok. Um, and uh, I guess before the pandemic, there was, of course, you know, Pokemon Go. Uh, but as we progress um, throughout the rest of the year, and even in the next few years, we'll continue to see the development of a lot of, um, I guess, new aged new aged ways of engagement uh, aside from you know the the obvious that i just mentioned there are a few nuances that have been um introduced to the space because um of the pandemic uh, one of them happens to be especially like in jamaica happens to be like online radio uh it really the radio industry has had been dying out before uh but the pandemic has essentially um re-sparked uh, a lot of a lot of innovations in that space and mainly made uh, the medium the medium and rather media available online in different ways. Uh, so uh, actually for the past couple of months, um, especially in, um, in the online space, we've had a lot of online radio hostings being held every week where like, for instance, dance hall or reggae music or even soca music has been played for uh, like a period of maybe five to six hours throughout the night. And then you have a lot of interactions from people who are probably listening in. So uh, now that we are in um, the crux of it, uh, we now need to imagine or rather reimagine what uh, the future of learning is going to look like. Uh, and so here I essentially have highlighted um, the three major components of um, or rather the three tiers of digital literacy. Uh, and I decided to go with digital literacy in particular because uh, I'm sure as I've discussed before, technology is essentially impacting every single um, aspect and facet of society. And what that means is that in order to uh, essentially operate in an effective way uh, and to communicate with everyone and to contribute to society um, generally, you will essentially need to be digitally literate in some, at least on at, at least on some level or scale, uh, for basic digital literacy uh, that essentially is tied down to like you know data annotation, IP collection, um, and essentially critical research ability. Um, and to kind of just touch on that last point, um, we've had the advent of like. Uh, fake news and um, a lot of deep fakes being developed from um, the internet and I guess bad actors. And so because of that, we're now seeing the emergence of misinformation being spread. Um, it is, it will be our responsibility um, to essentially learn the differences and discern uh, between actual facts um, and basically a lot of opinions on misinformation. And so that kind of lends to, to that aspect. Um, the next tier, of course, is intermediate, and that lends to basic software development um, and content development, as well as, you know, social media um, and marketing analysis um, in the digital space. Uh, the, the last tier, uh, which is where you find a lot of, um, I guess, people in tech, traditional tech companies, uh, as well as tech-enabled companies are, uh, you know, delving into things like software development, um, artificial intelligence development, augmented reality and virtual reality development, as well as, you know, game development. And so these are extremely key because, as I mentioned before, software is eating, um, software is eating everything. Um, and it is, of course, for sure, eating the future of work or rather the now of work, uh, but more specifically, the traditional approaches to work. I, in my previous slides, I had mentioned that a lot of monopolies are being broken down and essentially taken over by a lot of digital approaches and um, software development companies uh, because they have not been able to transform um, and adapt with the times. Um, and so what we will essentially see because uh, of, you know, of course, the pandemic, but post the pandemic is that a lot of companies, or rather I hope, that a lot of traditional companies will essentially transform uh, to more data-driven approaches uh, that will allow for better decisions to be made um, so that more capital, not more capital, but more profits can be achieved and by, but by extension, more human capacity can be developed. 
um, and it essentially leads to a healthier um, development of um, economies. Um, with that said, uh, we also need to um, we also need to recognize that a lot of these companies also need to innovate from within, and that only really can happen with the with the introduction of youth to the organization. Um, and so, with that said, um, I for sure know that um, in the past, um, especially even up to like probably two five years ago, um, a lot of companies in the Caribbean region, in particular have been um, very stagnant with regards to um, moving up employees or really hiring um, youth that have a lot of potential. Um, and, but more specifically, hiring youth and putting them in positions of power um, so that they can make decisions that essentially drive um, the, the impact of the entire um, company, but by extension, the people and customers that they serve. Um, this is extremely important, especially now as we um, continue to make a lot of generational shifts um, from millennials to you know even the Gen Zers, um, and so essentially, if you you know if companies and organizations don't do that, um, they're essentially missing out on a huge market share that is growing constantly every day. Um, but not just that, a huge market share that has a lot of um, capital incentive to spend. Um, I for sure know that. Uh, because of a lot of digital um, platforms and, and implementations in society, we now have the development um, of um, the ability for a lot of youth to make a lot of money online. And so um, with that being said, there along, the, along that same um, train of thought, um, in order to innovate and really um, take advantage of the market, you need to then um, automate a lot of your products and services. That should be the ultimate goal. So, uh, how essentially uh, do we become um, more digitally enabled um, as a society? Um, for sure, uh, I'm sure that, you know, you probably have noticed, but many people who have uh, really been able to take uh, classes online, um, they are for sure experiencing a lot of um, internet connectivity issues. And I'm sure you may have noticed that for those of you who are still going to school, many of your classmates probably can't participate because of the lack of connectivity generally. And uh, along with that, um, people don't necessarily have access to a lot of technology. Um, and by extension, there is a, a, a train of, you know, lack of robust software development. Um, Zoom is fine, for instance, as a, as a software, but it doesn't exactly lead to a lot of the um, the needs that we uh, essentially require to operate in um, the classroom setting or even at work. Um, and so in this digitally enabled society, it really will force us to rethink how we think about um, capitalism and um, you know, making money. Um, and in order to really touch on all of these um, four factors and to um, bring us into the digital age um, completely, it will require the develop, it will require the insight from a lot of organizations, um, both for-profit and non-profit, and also youth to really help to make the push and advocate for a lot of these changes. So uh, with that said, um, there are just, you know, two questions to um, leave and, and ask um, all of you. Uh, we need to start asking ourselves, and this is really for organizations at least for now, um, what steps are you as an organization making in you know, the preparation for the future um, while there are still employees? How are they being um, upskilled? How are they being trained? Um, because the meat of the matter is that you know, if that is not happening, they will essentially leave and um, themselves uh, and essentially move on to more progressive companies um, if traditional companies are interested in youth. And for youth, um, by extension, and even just schools as we are in the same ecosystem, um, how, how, are we, how are we, schools and youth, preparing for the next wave of learning? Um, and really that lends to um, beyond you know, learning 
uh, from online sources and and taking a lot of uh, and taking a lot of jobs on you know getting a lot of certification from um, the digital spaces. But what will things look like in the near future and even the future future as we continue on this trend? Um, and so essentially, the main question I'm going to ask or just leave you with is how are we going to and how are we willing to disrupt? Um, thank you. All right. So that was Nicholas Key. Um, of course, it was a very insightful and very informative presentation by, by Mr. Kiki. At this point, we would like to invite persons, you know, with questions and any comments to, you know, take the floor. And myself and Michelle will, of course, address those as many as we can, hopefully, within the time that we have left. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the raise your hand feature. Um, you go in your options and you'll see that. And just to add that um, it would be good if your questions are directed to the presenters so that they can answer, respond to the questions based on their presentation. Thank you. There's a raised hand from Odin. I think Odin could ask his question. All right, let me jump right in. Um, hi, everybody. Very, uh, very good presentations from all the presenters. Uh, Nicholas, you touched on organizations and schools. Um, it might be worth mentioning as well governments, because I think, you know, we have a lot of persons here from CARICOM and we have the ambassadors from all over the region here. So one of the things that we really need to look at and as well, maybe you can comment, it's not necessarily a question, but how are our individual governments and our countries looking to really shape the country in such a way that we can cushion what is to come? Because a lot of countries, as you realize, a lot of different prime ministers and a lot of governments are talking about how they're now looking into e-government services and digital systems for government. I mean, these are things that we should have done a long time ago. So if it is that we aren't necessarily seeing it from our leadership within our countries, how do we ex expect um, institutions and, and organizations to follow suit when this is something that governments have been trying to do for almost two decades now and it's still not a reality as yet? Yeah, um, I guess to, to further compound on, on that point, I um, completely agree with Odin. Um, a, lot of, a lot of governments, um, because of the heavy bureaucracy, and because of, um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the human capital within these bureaucracies, they, they happen to be a lot older. Um, they are very reluctant to change. Um, and, and, and you probably have noticed, but technology is not, uh, is not necessarily a waiting game. Uh, it is essentially very fast paced. And so uh, because of this, um, government institutions uh, and agencies haven't been able to keep up. Um, and we are, we are like miles, just probably years behind a lot of um, development of uh, systems and infrastructure that should have been in place decades ago. Um, and now we're having to play a lot of catch up. Um, they unfortunately cannot do it alone um, because you know, they don't necessarily have the capacity uh, or resources in, in any instance. Uh, and so it really, it really will take a lot of private sector intervention, um, unfortunately. Well, fortunately and fortunately to help shape a lot of the services and um, industry practices that we, that we see today. Um, but I'm definitely all for um, that the introduction of um, youth into, uh, into the space, into the government spaces that is, uh, to help change the narrative and to help innovate from within, just like uh, within organizations, traditional organizations as well. Um, okay, this is a question for Rochelle um, from Ms. Jeffrey. She's asking, um, how would you su suggest that young people who may have had a specific personal, personal or professional brand before COVID reshape that now, especially if what they are known for was something that they now need to reconfigure? 
Could you repeat the question for me, please? Okay, she said, how would you suggest that young people who may have had a specific personal or professional brand before COVID reshape that now, especially if what they, oh, they, sorry, especially if what they were known for was something that they now need to reconfigure? Okay, are you able to hear me? I'm hearing yes, you. I'm hearing you, Rochelle. Okay, good. Um, so whatever your brand was before COVID doesn't really matter. COVID doesn't change your brand. It changes your brand strategy. So if you were reaching out and doing more in-person activities, it means that you're doing more virtual activities and the kind of things you're engaged in. Not every invitation to attend a virtual event means that it's an invitation to be accepted. So you're your brand doesn't change because of, an situa of a situation like COVID. How you respond to COVID is what demonstrates the strength or the quality of your brand. I also want to touch on a point that was raised earlier. Contrary to popular belief, we in the Caribbean are good. Our governments are doing extremely well in terms of their response to COVID and also in terms of their utilization of technology. In other parts of the world, even in the great North America, the, <laughs> the paperwork, the lack of technology usage in government is ridiculous. So where we are as a region is leaps and bounds ahead of them. So I think that is something to be commended. And the fact that our governments are trying to be even more digital now is a, is a shift in their brand response. Thank All right, you. thank you very much for the response, which was very, very um, pointed. Are there any other questions? Yes, I have a question, and this is for Mr. Burton. Basically, the approach that the most of uh, most of the Caribbean islands took as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic is to basically use the lockdown approach. So it, I'm of the impression or I'm of the belief that it took a negative impact in terms of skills development. And I feel also it widens that gap. My question would be, how can we as a region make a rebound and uh, uh, addressing and bridging that gap using the tips that you shared? A more practical way. So oh, my best understanding of your question. I honestly actually thought that COVID created opportunities to, to, to bridge the skills gap. So we're seeing it differently because um, many schools offered them a lot of online courses. A lot of people had extra time to, to develop themselves. So I would hope that we could just continue on that uh, momentum post COVID where these schools actually continue to offer these services, these online platforms. As a Caribbean region, uh, you know, we're, we're one Caribbean. So if CARICOM could just continue to play a part in sharing whatever the opportunities are there, similar to this session, uh, if the Youth Ambassador Corps can continue to do their work where they're bringing us together, I think the job is being done. But most importantly is just what we individually are going to do. So like I mentioned, I'm trying to learn Spanish. You do something, Lyle does something, Lady Michelle does something, and that's really how it, how it works. Okay, thank you. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to jump in, unmute yourself and ask a question. I see we have one in the chat. It says, a question to Mr. Burton. What strategies do you suggest be used to encourage at-risk youth to understand the value of unpaid internship and volunteerism especially in the Caribbean setting where unemployment is high and the standard of living is high and persons are thinking of survival. So when it comes to at-risk youth or in youth in general, the best strategy that we have found through the Nolan Youth Foundation is where young people who are educating or teaching other young people. It's simply put, you know, like sometimes our parents may tell us to do something, but we don't listen. But if a friend tells us, we actually do it. I think that's the strategy that we, we, we can adopt, where we find young people like all of us that are on this chat, and we all just take one person on their wings, and they can see and actually relate to what's happening. 
So it's a strategy we use here uh, and with a strategy we use at our own youth retreat where it is a retreat for the youth by the youth. I'd like to add to, to that well said, Mr. Burton. I'm chiming in because this is a pet peeve of mine, right? So excuse the passion. I have, you know that I'm in HR and I've had multiple youth reaching out to me about internships and about job opportunities. I have offered over a dozen unpaid internships and very few people take them up. Now, let me give you a reality check. COVID-19 has left quite a few persons unemployed. Persons with years of experience working, persons with qualifications coming out of their eyeballs, masters and PhDs. You are just leaving university with a bachelor's degree in a year when summer internships have been canceled, in a year when summer work programs have been canceled. It is highly, highly, highly unlikely that you're going to get a paid internship at this stage. In my entire career, I have had over 10 jobs, and of the 10, I've only had four paid jobs. And the salaries of those four paying jobs could have paid me five times over for those other unpaid jobs. Never had to start at a receptionist desk, never had to work in a call center, never had to work as a clerk. You know why? Because I went through unpaid internships. And the experiences I gained from those unpaid internships, I could never pay for. The connections, the level of interaction, the, th the, the, the way those internships set me up in my career for the next big move. I couldn't pay for that. I couldn't beg that. I couldn't buy that. The best way to get unpaid internships, so simple, a post on LinkedIn. Reach out to those companies, set your sites, list them out on companies or organizations that you want to work with and name the title that you want meaning the kind of work you're willing to do. Perfect time to do it. When I was doing internships, I had to find my own money for lunch and transportation at the time. Now, most companies are willing to take on remote interns. Oh my gosh, that's a dream. I wish I could have been a remote intern. You can imagine waking up during summer, going to whatever party and then still getting all the work experience everybody else getting. So this is the right time for you to take on these opportunities. Reach out to the companies, write to their HR departments to say, does your accounting team need additional support? I know that you've laid off workers, but I'm here as an accounting major, just graduated and I'm willing to work as an accounting assistant in, in your organization, free of charge. I just want the experience. And, I, and you, you state also that you want to work with someone specific. So I want to work with someone who is ACCA certified or a project management professional or a certified HR professional because that's what I want to be. You can not pay for that connection or that experience going forward and automatically you've landed yourself a sponsor because that organization is always going to remember that you were motivated by career and not money. Okay, David has raised their hands. Thank you, um, everyone, and very interesting discussion. I must say that I enjoyed this session today. Um, my name is Kabel David. I work at the Carbon Committee Secretariat as a Senior Project Officer for Internal Evaluation. And although I was listening, because I think I'm learning a lot from you, I, I think the last intervention by Ms. James, is it, Ms. James? Um, really prompted me to share my experience briefly and for what it's worth I'll share it. maybe someone out there maybe it might reinforce what Ms. James is saying so I studied in Cuba um, I don't think I had a choice um, I my parents couldn't afford to um, to pay for me to attend university I'm any US based or um, Caribbean based university so I got a scholarship to study in Cuba and um, I came back after six years and could not find a job in my area of work because I think everyone expected that if you're going to practice psychology, you would have had to have at least a master's degree. And then I know many of you may also be aware 
with the challenges faced by Cuban trained um, students or professionals where they, where they come back and people question whether or not they're able to function in an English speaking country. Um, so I, after applying and couldn't, I couldn't find a job, one day I made an appointment with the Permanent Secretary of Health. And I was grateful for the secretary who allowed me to meet with him. And interestingly, he said, you know, Miss David, you seem like a, a proactive young lady. You, see, you, you seem like you, you're ready for work and you're excited about working, but I really do not have any jobs to offer at this moment. And so he said, the only thing I could do is maybe you could come in a few days and, um, you know, um, I'm going to call somebody within the HIV unit. Perhaps you'd want to work there and, you know, observe and, you know, volunteer your time. And I said, sure. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I will take it on. He said, you know, we were not going to pay you, right? I said, yes, it's okay. I will take it on. And then I remember going every day on time to the HIV program for six months. I, I think I returned in July and um, I went to the HIV program for six months. Like I was employed there. I was helping with presentations. I was um, going to the trainings. I recall one day, um, um, a, a, a private practitioner came to me and he said, I'm asking you now to leave this um, um, thing that you're doing, this voluntary work that you're doing and come and look at me in my private practice and I assure you, it's going to do you better. And let me tell you why, you're not getting any money now, but I'm, a, I'm going to give you this amount of money at the end of the month every day and you will be running my private practice. And he said, if you do not get back to me, at the end of today, then I would have realized that you're not interested. I thought of it, I waited, I was in the middle of a training and I had to think at that point what was best. And so I stayed at the train and decided not to go to that private practice. Um, long story short, I ended up being coached and mentored by a lot of, pe a lot of persons who saw my potential. Um, namely the coordinator of HIV at the time. She pushed me, she brought me to every meeting. Um, she highlighted my strengths. She, she also um, helped me to work on my weaknesses. And after six months of volunteering, a position came up within that unit. And then she wrote a, a letter to the permanent secretary asking them to keep me on because it would be a loss for the unit not to keep me on. And then six years after that, I ended up working at the CARICOM Secretariat because of my experience in HIV and also because I had an edge over the other, I guess, the other um, persons contending for the position because I had a foreign language. So I'm just saying that to say that sometimes money isn't all and passion and drive and really working towards your goal and also not compromising your values it's really important to, to, to get ahead and to stay ahead. Thank you. And I hope it's, I hope this was able to, this, this story is able to inspire someone out there. Thank you, Carvel. There are some other questions in the chat. There's one for Rochelle. And uh, um, it is, in your opinion, should schools reopen for physical face-to-face -face classes in the coming semester? And what issues or circumstances should we weary in the event that they do? So, um, so the response I provided is that, in my opinion, schools should reopen. It just means that how we culture our students is going to be a little bit different. But the risk we run is if we keep our children at home, it has greater implications for how they are socialized and how they're raised. So what I mean by that is if you look in countries like Asia, they're teaching, they're, they're taking children through an orientation routine of you have to, you wash your hand and you sanitize your hand and then you walk up to this little robot and check your temperature. So it's kind of fun for them, but they are not being encouraged to be distant because in that society, they have their own problems with, um, with social interaction. If in, our car in the Caribbean, we decide to go this route, then eventually we're going to have children who are, and if you think about it even now, when you go into a, this, any store, any space and they're 
testing your temperature or they're spraying um, your hands with alcohol. Just observe how the children are reacting to that entire experience, right? Of being outside and being in this space. Now think about that in the context of this person being an adult doing business, conducting business in the working world later on, it's going to have serious long-term effects if we say that every time there is a pandemic or every time there is a crisis, the response is, let's stay home. We responded this way because we've never seen anything like COVID, but it doesn't mean that COVID has to be our permanent modus operandi. It doesn't have to be permanently how we operate. Um, Yes, Joshua, schools inclusive of universities and more so universities because the money that you're paying for an online education is not the same as what you're paying for in-person class. This session today would have been so much more engaging and a lot, more, a lot different if you got to see me and talk to me and we got to shake hands and meet and greet and hug. But being here in this virtual arena, there are other distractions that are taking place. I mean, some of us are even at work or we're juggling home and then some other persons are probably scurrying to get something to eat. So there are so many other distractions around that we're not, we're, we are no longer the kind of beings who can sit and be attentive and tune in fully to what is going on. Why? Because if I don't want to pay attention, I just shut off my camera. So I think it is imperative that we create and actively create that environment for us to return to face-to-face -to -face interaction. Thank you. Antoinette, can you say if there are any hands up or other questions? No, I don't see any other hands up, nor any other questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, McAllister? Right, at this point, if we have no more questions, I would like to just share what for me have been Matt? some of the key takeaways. Matt, Chad here. Hey, yeah, Chad. Just a, okay. Just pulled a quick question um, to Regis. Right, sure. um, you said, I, I put it in the chat, but essentially I was just um, inquiring, well, great presentation, um, but, um, all three. Um, I was inquiring regarding the, um, you, you mentioned about linking a barcode to, to your CV. I was just inquiring with respect to the uh, websites that you utilize to do the personal websites. So Chad, I basically just took the, my LinkedIn barcode and put it into a, a bar, my LinkedIn link my profile link and put it into a barcode reader uh, and it generated the code for me. I took the picture of the barcode and I just placed it at the bottom of my resume and added a line say, please scan barcode for more information about Regis Burton. Um, so once you would have scanned it, you would have taken you to my LinkedIn profile. So likewise, oh, okay, okay. You, uh, yeah. so likewise you can do it for your website, your personal mm -hmm. Facebook page. It's totally up to you. Yeah, Whatever represents you well. So I chose LinkedIn because it kept a professional image of myself versus Instagram and Facebook. Okay. I thought you were speaking um, more particular to uh, like a personal website. I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't realize you meant the, um, the LinkedIn profile. Thanks. So that was, thanks, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. As we come to the closing of the, um, forum, I think McAllister was going to share with us his feedback on the presentations. Right. So if there are no more questions, and of course, as we, ending up, as we are uh, closing up on this, this session, I just wanted to share a couple of the statements that were made by the presenters that really caught my attention and stood out to me. Of course, I think there are numerous examples, and I really hope that um, as many people as possible leave this session with things that will possibly change the way they think about themselves and the way they operate and move forward and influence other people. So for me, here are my key takeaways from Regis Burton. Find balance between being charitable and taking care of self. You cannot pour from a cup that is empty. You understand? So in order to take care of others, then you need to take care of yourself. Uh, from Ms. James, seek to understand self. 
who you are, what you have to offer, what you want to be, and how you're going to get there. Remember to be authentic and to seek validation from yourself and not be thirsty for approval from others. Uh, from Mr. Key, be innovative, right? Take advantage of the current market. There are opportunities for you to generate revenue online. It's just up to you now to understand how you can do that. For employers, assess your current operations. Consider how you're adapting to the changes happening in the world and how you're preparing yourself and your staff for the future. All right, these are my key takeaways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, McAllister. And just to add a little bit that there, there are some salient things that we need to remember here today, that we spoke about emotional intelligence, how important it is. There should be no age disparity or age differentiation. Let us see ourselves as one and how we all contribute um, to, to, to the building of our, and the development of our region. Um, let us forget about gender differentiation as well. In the time of COVID, what is important is your brand. There's no need to change your brand, but to change the strategies that you use um, to, to make your brand be known. The authenticity that is important as well. As you move forward in a time of COVID, it is important for us to understand or to gain digital literacy. It is also important for us to see our youth as key stakeholders in the process as we move forward in this digital world. And it is also important for us to rethink the way we have been doing things and to disrupt the status quo. I truly want to thank you all today for participating in this um, youth forum. I want to express sincere appreciation to the presenters specifically. Um, guys, you did an excellent job. It's, it's words cannot express how I feel at this point in time in terms of what you have put forward. And I'm sure the participants would have learned much from what you presented. I want to thank specifically the CYAs, the CARICOM Youth Ambassadors that were on the planning committee that assisted in organizing this youth forum. I want to thank also the director, Mrs. Royer, who gave us our opening remarks and also thank our program manager, Dr. Hillary Brown as she supported us in the organization of this youth forum. I want, want to also thank those behind the scene that made, that gave us the technological support and made all of this possible. And most of all, I want to thank you, the participants today, for joining us as we recognize Youth Skill Day. Let us all put our hands together and pave the way forward. I thank you.